Agency's Drinking Beer is brought to you by Proposify, software that helps you deliver beautiful proposals in the cloud and close more deals. Welcome to the 60th episode of Agency's Drinking Beer. On today's show, we're talking to Kenny Wynn, the CEO of Big Fish Presentations, which is a service to help rid the world of boring presentations. And he's going to talk to us today about how you can perfect your next client pitch. A little crusty, kind of like what you were feeling. Maybe what was it yesterday? Yeah, it was yesterday. Yeah, turns out I just needed to sleep in the morning. Yeah, I just need more coffee. You need more. Co- I don't think that's ever really the the true answer. No, to but it, life's it's, problems. It's a quick fix. It is a quick fix sometimes. Um, uh, for those that don't know, my name is Kyle Racky, and you are what is my name? Uh, Captain something, <laughs> Captain Springer. Yeah. K Spring. Actually, I call you K Spring. Yeah, K Spring's good. Was I the first person to ever call you K-Spring? Yep. And you know why I did? Because of um, K-Fed, Kevin Federline. Oh, I didn't know that. Britney Spears' old boyfriend was Kevin Federline, and they called him K-Fed. He's much... And you're Kevin Springer. He's much better looking. He has more tattoos. Have you... Yeah, you haven't seen him (laughs) lately. No, I'm joking. (laughs) He got really fat after uh, What? That scrawny little guy? Really? Oh, he's like, yeah, like... No. He really let himself go after well, you know, He probably got a lot of money out of that divorce. He got a ton of money from yeah. it. Yeah. Hit, it's a lot of hoagies. Yeah. Eating cream cakes. Yeah. Wow. Well, because we shouldn't fat shame him. No, we should That's kind of mean of us. Yep. Um, cool. Well, we have an interview coming up very soon with Kenny. Big fan. Oh, fan, my a, goodness. A fan boy, even. Big time. He really liked us. Yeah. And we liked him. Yeah. Uh, and he has really good information about pitching and presentations, which I love to talk about. I love talking about presentations. Mm, and sales, too. That was fun. Yeah. He knew who Zig, you know, for his age, Zig Ziglar. I yeah, mean, well, that's he... not on the show. That <laughs> We talked about I know, that but afterwards. Still, but still, it's very cool that he knew who he was. Well, now everyone's going to be disappointed going, I want the Zig Ziglar talk. Uh, I know. Jeez. My fault. Got to think about the listeners, Kevin. I know. Um, maybe before we talk about, or before we get into the interview, we want to talk about something. Uh, I had written a post last week announcing that we're um, that Proposify is launching a partner program. So this may not apply to people who just like this podcast for the information and aren't necessarily into our product. That's fine. We hate you, but that's fine. You can just <laughs> listen to this podcast. We don't hate you. Yeah. Um, but for those who, who like our product and use it, um, we're launching a partner program. And why are we doing that, Kevin? Well, why do you think? I mean, why do people put partner programs together? Hmm. For many reasons. That's true. Number one, sales. Yeah. <laughs> let's face it. Let's, let's, come on. It's called it's spade to spade. You're all about the sales, man. Well, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's true. Sales is good. I think the big reason we launched it, though, is that uh, we get a lot of people who want some hand holding, some customization for Proposify. And we started a few months ago, uh, maybe even more, maybe six months. We started offering a service where we would help convert people's proposals into Proposify. We would offer additional training, um, and we still get people who want us to write and design custom proposals for them, like a service. And we just can't do that. We don't want to do it. We're not in the service business anymore. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but we're just not in that business anymore. Uh, Our customers, though, many of our customers, however, freelancers and agencies are in that business. And uh, a number of them have reached out to us to say that they would would like to resell Proposify. They would like to offer training, customization, and and, uh, stuff like that to our clients, which is great. They can take that. We'd happily give that business to them. Um, The other thing, too, is we have an API coming out soon, a public API. So you're actually going to be able to build your own applications on top of Proposify and connect to it. And um, so we anticipate a lot of customers who are maybe bigger companies and have their own internal applications, maybe their own internal custom-built CRM or something that they're, they might want a provider who can actually build that sort of bridge between our product and theirs. Um, so those, that's kind of, I think, all the reasons really behind the partner program. So uh, I did a webinar yesterday to this, this small group uh, of about 30 to 40 kind of the, ba- the, the pilot, you know, partners. Because um, right now it's very early stage. We don't have a lot of the systems set up in place yet. 
Um, we're working on that. But uh, but if you want to get involved, if you want to be a partner for when we actually roll out the the, the program, which is going to be in about a month or two, hard to put an exact date on it, but we're trying to get it out as soon as we can. Um, if you're interested in that, then there's a link to a form. So what we want you to do is go to uh, proposify.biz and click on the blog, blog article titled, We're Launching the Proposify Partner Program and We Want You to Apply. Um, you could also get there by going proposify.biz slash blog slash proposify dash partner dash program. And there is links to the application form there. Um, so anyway, if you're interested in that, if you want to earn some recurring revenue and uh, get referred clients on our marketplace and get some other cool benefits, check that out. Um, cool. Well, with no further ado, then uh, let's move on to the really cool interview with Kenny Wynn. I'd like to introduce Kenny Wen to the uh, show today. Kenny is the CEO of 368, a digital experience agency based out of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And he also runs Big Fish Presentations, a service to help rid the world of boring presentations. Their clients have included GE, Verizon, and Paramount Pictures. He's going to talk to us today about how you can perfect your pitch. Welcome to the show, Kenny. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. And first, I must say, happy birthday. Oh, thank you. I'm glad yes. you guys remembered. Uh, this, I remember in my email to you guys asking, like, hey, I think I have something cool to share. I, like, dropped it. It was my birthday. That if we can make it happen. That means something great. But, you know, this is, like, by far one of the coolest birthdays to wake up to and be like, man, I get to be on, the like, my favorite podcast. Oh, that's so nice to say. I wonder if we should get the team in to sing happy birthday to him. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be kind of cool. <laughs> we'll, we'll record it after and then just yeah. work it in. Um, do you mind me asking, uh, how old are you turning? I'm turning 26. Oh, cool. It's a, it's a good age. We have a lot of 26. <laughs> I'm feeling great. Yeah, no, you're in your prime. It's, it's downhill from, from there. I think that's the average oh, age really? of our thanks, team. Thanks for the heads up. It only gets worse from here. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, uh, okay. Well, happy. I hope you're. I hope there's more to your birthday than just being on this uh, this this rinky dink show. Like, you know, I hope you're going out and doing something fun, especially considering it's Friday. Oh yeah, we had a. I had a wonderful surprise birthday party last night by my fiance with like forty of my friends, like closest friends, and it, it was incredible because, you know, with all, have you all heard about the Baton Rouge flood stuff going on? No. Like down I here, so, like we yeah. had. We had like the worst flooding we've had in like I think like almost like since Hurricane Sandy. That's what the Red Cross said, and it was really really bad. We're talking about like you know hundred hundred over a hundred thousand homes were like ravaged and people were affected down here. So you know down here it's been very uh, gloomy, but at the same time very resilient as people got together, helped rebuild houses, and really just coming together as community, taking care of shelters, cooking food. You know, my last couple weeks. I've been helping out because like, luckily I didn't get affected by the flood, but I wanted to do everything I possibly could to help others. So I helped co-organize a fundraiser, which ended up raising about $50,000 for uh, flood relief victims. And also, you know, went to a couple of shelters and homes to help out as well, because, you know, you never realize like what is really important in life until a natural disaster hits you. Then you realize the human side of things is the most important thing in life. You know, we should put in the show notes maybe a link to uh, or a couple links that you know of uh, in case people want to uh, donate any money to the relief fund. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be happy to send that. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's inc- I had no idea. I guess I'm not checking the news enough. <laughs> Now, well, no, now it feels really a little bit silly to go it. talk about presentations. <laughs> <laughs> no, the news has been really bad about that. And so that's admittedly where, you know, the press came a little bit later. But like during the time, we were wondering, like, where's the help coming in? Like, Where's the awareness? Because it's not every day where you get like two feet of water in your house. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's like really scary, especially like in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, where like a lot of the homes are affected where no flood zones. And they call it like the young hundred year flood. Like this is a flood that's like just unprecedented. I think it was over like trillion pounds of water over 19 days. I think so. It's a lot of, lot of damage that happened, but you know, I'll say this, like we had Katrina, when uh, it hit New Orleans a long time ago, New Orleans bounced back better than ever, and I feel like Baton Rouge will too as well. Yeah. 
I hope so. And uh, yeah, that's. Yeah, I've seen I've seen some of the pictures on CNN. It's uh, it's pretty bad. Hmm. Yeah, but we'll make it through, man. Yeah. Well, hope so. Well, let's uh, let's change the course of uh, conversation now to uh, <laughs> to something else that's uh, definitely not as uh, uh, you know important in in that sense. But for those listening, who uh, especially people who run agencies, um, often they have to pitch their work to clients to win deals. And I remember you telling me before that this was something that you notice is a big pain point among a lot of people. Um, it's just the idea of being able to pitch and present and not be boring about it. So, I mean, how did you even, first of all, get into that? Um, like, why did you start Big Fish Presentations? Man, so it, it was crazy. Like, every great idea happens by accident, I feel like, where you just see something and you just feel calling for it. It might happen actually in January 2012, when I was still a student at Louisiana State University, where I saw a Fortune 500 executive come up and deliver a talk. And I remember before the talk happened, I was so excited, guys, because I kept thinking, Fortune 500 executive, this guy's going to be an amazing presenter. There's no way. Like I thought you have to be a great communicator in order to be an executive. I was young and naive, obviously. And well, what happened was, I remember when he got up there and the guy uploaded his slides, I saw at the bottom of the PowerPoint, in the corner, I saw 200 slides, and I'm thinking, oh, my God. And sure enough, the guy who was supposed to go on for about an hour went on for two hours and read off every single freaking slide wow. for two hours. And he started making his own jokes, like laughing at his own jokes, asking his own questions, answering his own questions. And as I was sitting there, like after like hour one, I started thinking, oh my God, what if there's a company that can help out like these five, Fortune 500 companies? Because if there are guys like him presenting like that, probably there's some kind of business I can think of where I can help them create great presentations and maybe even help them become better speakers. And around this time was when Prezi was being launched. And so I thought, like, how about I create a really just cool presentation side hustle company? And that's when the idea of Big Fish Presentation was born, was in January 2012. Wow. That's really neat. And what, um, you know, what is, what is it about presentations? Did you have a background in public speaking before, or why was it that you were just interested in the idea of, and, and how did you know even uh, how to create a great presentation? You know, my background is actually not in presentations. It's culinary arts. I actually trained uh, in the kitchen for like most of my high school and like early college days. My well, there you go. Presentation is key in, in uh, creating great food, right? Exactly. Well, you think about it, like great presentation, like content, that's the ingredients, great presentation design, that's the actual design of the dish, great delivery, that's the flavors that you have. But most importantly, like every great meal and every great presentation, you have to have a phenomenal experience behind it. That's everything else. That's the intangibles. Those are the things that make things memorable is the actual experience. Because you will always remember like any great piece of art and food, I, I say, is always like and presentations are the fastest form of art because it's the most quickly digestible. Mm. And, but it'll always live on in memory if it's great. So oh. with that being said, though, like with my background, uh, I started a student organization at LSU. And I always had to speak in front of others. But I felt like I didn't really come into my own until probably a couple years ago when people started asking me, why don't you give speeches on how to do presentations? And that's when I realized, man, I got to whip this up because if I suck at this, <laughs> that's really bad. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a very meta presentation, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a really better way to look at it. But at the same time, like, I had that reflection where I sat down, like, man, if I screw up a presentation on presentations, I'm just going to quit. Like, I'm going <laughs> back in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. But I suppose that gets you good because then when you're you know, when you're going through and putting together that presentation, you're kind of working on your own game at the same time, right? Oh, absolutely. So like one of our clients is Ted Global, actually. So when we work with like Ted, we work with a lot of the Ted Ed people. And uh, what's really cool in that is that I get to like constantly see how the best of the best practice their presentations. And I learned something literally new in almost any project that I took that I take or even any presentation pitch that I learned. For example, the other, uh, about earlier this year, I went and pitched a company called Digital Realty, where now one of my best mentors, Raymond Hawkins, works over there. And I remember when I pitched it to him, this guy who's a phenomenal presenter in his own right, like, 
afterwards critiqued me. And I was so surprised, but it was one of the best learning lessons. He said, you know what you should do when you begin your presentation? I never even heard about this piece of advice. You should pause because what that does, it calibrates the room to be focused on you. Leave about a five to second pause right when you start, start on stage and just let the moment sit. Let the audience focus on you and then you go and kill it. And now I do that for any one of my presentations, but it's so cool is that I learn so much new stuff as I go out there. And I recommend that to anybody that wants to become a better presenter. It's like use any opportunity when you communicate with someone to learn because there's always something you can learn. That's such a great tip for people when they're giving presentations because especially when you're nervous, you don't pause enough. See, I just did it there. Um, <laughs> that was good. <laughs> and it, and it, it makes people feel more at ease because when you're nervous, you're trying to fill every last bit of you know empty air with words so people end up going um uh they're just trying to fill silence because they're uncomfortable with it but then when you have like the the kind of the confidence and poise to just you know let the uh let the moment breathe a little bit it just yeah you're right it just adds so much power to what you're saying yes it does and that's like the part where we like to build charisma is if you pause and you have people focus on you that right there is the moment where you have everyone's attention, so you better kill it. And that's why we put so much emphasis on three things in the presentation. It's the content, design, and delivery. And within the content, we say it's so important to make sure you have an effective opener. Because if you don't have an effective opener, most likely people are going to fall, it's going to fall flat. So you want to have like either a story, a joke, a statistic, a quote, something to grab people's attention. The best way to always recommend when starting out a presentation is to start with a personal story to make people feel like they can relate to you as the speaker. Yeah. Yeah. It works so well as, as opposed to just going into uh, facts and figures. I know, uh, have you read the book pitch anything? By oh yeah. Warren I actually talked with Orrin the other day. We were, planning, we were planning a war, a webinar together. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, he, that book was amazing. I read it last year. I was kind of late to the party. I know it was out for quite a while before that, but there was so much good stuff in there. I even like wrote a blog post about it. Um, and I read it. Cover. I read your blog post about it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, you know, you live and breathe this every day. So, I mean, you know, what? I guess what do you think when... So there's one thing giving like a presentation um, where you're not actually trying to get necessarily a deal out of it, right? Like a, a TEDx conference is, um, you know, people trying to share information, trying to entertain, trying to inform their audience, but there's no close at the end. Do you, do you help? I assume that you also help your clients with presentations like a client pitch or an investor pitch where they're actually trying to move them down to make a decision on something, right? Yes. And we, that's actually a pretty common, that's actually the most common types of they work on is sales presentations. And what we learned from that is like the most important part for a sales presentation is to have a very effective call to action and simplification of what you are selling. Because the more you make your audience think during the presentation, the harder it is to get that message across. You want it to be so simple and emotional because people make decisions more emotional than logic. If you can give a great sales presentation with that bonding and rapport, and not only on top of that, you had Amanda Holmes on here at one point, and she's great. And everything that she said was about bonding and rapport, building that trust. It's so true in presentations, but what we always say in a great sales presentation is there's an effective call to action. And if you have an effective call to action that is very directly, what do you need and what can the audience do to help you? And it's positioned in a way that's a benefit to the audience, you're in a really good place. And we work a lot on that because every call to action needs to be strategically place somewhere in the presentation. Mm. So you want to make sure people know kind of what the next step is. Um, but I remember one thing reading Oren Claff's book that he talked about, especially like if you're doing a pitch to say a big client or a big investor is you kind of don't end the, the presentation with like, so what do you think? Or can we make a decision? Cause it sort of puts you as the, as the beta, it sort of wrecks your power frame a little bit. What do you think about that? Exactly. I know. I completely agree. And, uh, you know, when I talked with Orrin, it was just like this, where I get to talk with people I admire so much. And I was kind of nerding out and, you know, just asking him some questions and like appealing to like, for example, in the book, a lot of the different parts of the brain. Do you remember that part where like he outlined the different yeah, parts of the brain, brain that you appeal to? Yeah. 
I, I, I love that as well. And I believe he called one part, like the gator part of the brain. What was it? Do you remember? Yeah, croc, croc brain. Yeah, the croc brain. Yeah, the, the croc brain part of the brain. And I love that. It's like when you're going to appeal like, to like the most rudimentary part of a brain or like something like that of those lines where it's like something really easy, I feel like it's a much more easier pitch at that point. Because if you're able to appeal to someone on a very rudimentary, like, and not like a very high sophisticated level, like, as a person, that's where I feel like the closest presentations get. For example, whenever I go and pitch a, a presentation to get a presentation, I always ask a person, you know, I might not be in your industry, but I do know what a great presentation feels and looks like. And I always ask them, tell me about the best presentation you've ever seen. And more than likely, it'd be something very close to the best presentation I've ever seen, filled with stories, emotion, and it's very memorable. And sometimes they can't remember what they said, but they can sure remember how that person felt or how they felt in the presentation. And from that, I then create that bonding rapport where it's like, we can help you do that because I've seen it too. And you've seen how great presentations can be. Let's build one together. And so by, by appealing like that, we work a lot better together because we know what great presentations look like. There's a common goal. Mm. Yeah. What uh, What are your favorite presentations you've ever seen? You know, my favorite one actually might be the Jimmy Valvano one. Have you seen that with the ESPYs Award? No. It's a really good one where he talks about, he's actually like, when he walked on stage, he had cancer. He passed away a couple, uh, I think a couple months later, but he was a really famous basketball coach that spoke about what cancer does, like did to him and how he was so resilient. You couldn't even tell. Like there was so much life in his eyes when he gave a presentation, but I really loved the way how he displayed his points to make it very clear. Laugh, cry. I got the third one, but I remember how it made me feel. And that's when you know it's a great presentation. Mm-hmm. I recommend anyone to watch it. We actually covered it in our book, mm-hmm. uh, the Jimmy Valvano speech itself on like what made it so powerful. Wow. Yeah, that is, that, that is, um, you know, kind of a an important part of a great presentation is, like you said, one that sort of takes you on an emotional journey. It's not facts and figures. It's not statistics. It's the story. It's uh, you know, there's low points. There's high points. You know, taking them on a roller coaster, I think, would be the ultimate goal of any any presentation, right? Yeah, exactly. And you can't always have like an emotion, like in a roller coaster. If you always go up, you never come down. So you have to have like supporting content that is logical but you should also have that rising content that's emotional and so having that balance out for example emotional content typically is stories start off with that but sometimes you have to back up your stories with facts as logical content so maybe the emotion factor goes down a little bit unless the content really resonates with somebody and let's say you follow up with another story or statistic that completely scares someone the emotion the emotional roller coaster goes up and then you start backing up with other facts and so when the first reveal of that statistic might have shock someone they might have been like okay i'm listening a little bit more now so it goes down again then you follow up with some other emotional such as a joke a story depending on the situation or another statistic that's how you keep people really engaged is that you can't always have a flat line or a high rising arc you have to have a pretty standard up and down up and down up and down emotional graph for a presentation to be successful yeah you know what reminds me of that is when you watch good documentaries, they do that a lot. Mm-hmm. They'll take you on, you know, let's say it's about a famous person. They'll talk about all the good things that were going on there in their life at this time. And then this happened and it was really awesome and they were so happy. And then tragedy struck, <laughs> you know, and it yeah, sort of goes along yeah. that up and down line, <laughs> right? Yeah. And the thing is, like, you might even know, like, when you watch a documentary, what tragedy struck to, but the way they position it and present it, it makes you more engaged, even if you know what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. What what do you, you talked about humor. Um, and I mean, obviously if you're funny, like comedians are probably the best people to watch and, and learn from, I think when it comes to speaking, because they get the beats oh, yeah. down on the timing and everything. But some people I think struggle with this because when they're giving a presentation, you know, everybody wants to be funny. Everybody wants to get a laugh out of the audience, but it's really hard to. And what if they're not just naturally funny? What do you like? Is there anything people can do to work on that, or should they just like avoid jokes if you're not a naturally a funny person? Comedians are able to succeed, I believe, because of three reasons. One is they know and they set the scene. Is that when people come up in, they have the expectation that things are going to be funny, and so their minds are more tilted toward. I'm going to be listening to a very emotional 
type of presentation. It's going to build me a lot of joy and laughter. The second is that comedians are really good. If you listen to like really famous comedians, say like Aziz Ansari, Louis C.K., you hear from them that they rarely say ums, ahs, or you knows. They're at the highest level where they are so well rehearsed, but they make it look seamless. Is that when they walk up there, you never know that it was something that was rehearsed over many, many, many hours. It seems like they're just talking up there. And that's what the best comedians do is they make it look effortless in a conversation. When you tell a joke and you sound super, super, super rehearsed, it doesn't come off right. But when you tell a joke and it comes off in a way that's very sincere, funny, or even just like downright shocking where it makes you uncomfortable, you're more than likely to laugh. Mm. And the third you know, and, thing... Oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, and also if you think about it too, the, the pauses that, that like Louis yeah. C.K. does and whatnot makes it sound like it's not totally rehearsed. Yeah. He's really good with that. Yeah. Well, that was my third point was the pauses, actually. <laughs> so yeah. the pauses is what makes it so much more powerful is that if you're able to pause and you build that charisma and that authenticity, that genuineness that comes from that pause and that eye contact that the comedian has. There we go. And so for any normal person that's looking up there to create a joke, I recommend to say, read the room. Read the room is the first one. And the second one is, if you're going to tell a joke, make sure you rehearse it. And make sure that if it's something that can make you laugh, chances are it will make other audience members laugh as well. Hopefully, but as long as you read the room, you got to think about it like this. If you don't believe in the joke that you're about to tell, why would others believe in it as well? So yeah. in that case, rehearse it. <laughs> and the, I mean, the other thing too that com- comedians do is they, sometimes the jokes fall flat, but they try that stuff out on just little shows that they travel to. And then when they're doing like a TV special, they take the stuff that they already know works. So if like, if a joke mm-hmm. works once, you know, you kind of know it's going to work again, generally. You know, unless the yeah. audience is really different group, right? Yeah, if you're like a completely different demographic, I can see that. And that goes for agency pitches too, is that in a lot of the pitches that we do have, what we do train people on, is that we do say that if you have a chance to make a joke where it's lighthearted and where it'll be appreciated, go ahead and do that because jokes build bonding and rapport. You can make the other person laugh. You always remember the guy that's really funny or the woman that's really funny in your life because when you're really sad or you have a big pain, you think about them because you really want them around you because they can bring light to the situation and make you feel happier. And that's the same way when you go and pitch. That's how you can become memorable is by becoming a joyful, joking, but serious person. And so if you're able to master humor, it, it can go a very long way. Hmm. So let's kind of apply this to more of a tangible situation because i think a lot of the people who listen to this show are um they run digital agencies and small web design shops and you know things like that um so i think that in probably most cases where they're doing pitches or presentations it's to to win over a client to maybe get them as a Mm -hmm. retainer or win a, a project i know we did a lot at uh at the agency that we used to run i maybe we didn't do enough i think that's something that a lot of people they just you know, they get a lead in the door for a project and then they just send them a proposal and then just hope they sign it and they don't actually say, I want to meet with you or I want to do an online presentation. I want to like actually pitch this uh, proposal yeah. to you. I don't want to just shoot it off and hope somebody signs it. What advice would yeah. you give? So for me, I always love, I love the dog and pony show, guys. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> it's it, what makes, you have to get the client jazzed up somehow or the prospect for understanding like how much this means not only to them, but to you. And for me, it's like, whenever I do get a lead in, I try to make as, as much human connection as possible with them through a presentation. So the reality is with Big Fish is that a lot of our clients aren't in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. For example, you said GE, Verizon, early Paramount Pictures, like they're not anywhere near Baton Rouge. So anytime I can to go present an idea, I'll go up there. But I always try to not, when I send a proposal over, to call them immediately and almost as if giving a presentation where I'm like, hey, look, I know you're about to open that proposal. And like, whoa, look at this price. But before we do that, let me share with you some really cool things. And this is a cool trick that uh, my mentor Raymond Hawkins taught me, is that whenever we give a presentation to an executive, you never want to present the proposal with the entirety of all the legal terms. Present an executive summary. Of, it, of all the values and the benefits they get, not the features, but the benefits they get. And that way, because most executives are so busy 
you come off as someone that's very straight, direct to the point, and tells them what they need. And that's by far been one of the most effective ways we always tell people to give presentations, especially for agencies giving pitches, is that if you go in a room and do a dog and pony show, or you go over the phone, wherever you're pitching, is that you're pitching someone that's a decision maker that doesn't have a lot of time, and you ask them to go through a whole presentation with them, whether through a webinar or through the screen, and you present a bunch of legal terms, most likely they have someone else that can bet that. Focus on the immediate benefits. So what we say is, why don't you just print out a one-pager of all the things that they're going to get and make their lives better, and you walk them through that. That's a much more interesting presentation on their end because it's very simple and direct to the point. And since we started doing that, we've been able to convert a lot more deals. And I honestly truly believe that people are busy. And if you're able to consider, be considerate like that, you're more likely to win an opportunity. It reminds me too of in um, in the pitch anything book when or in Clap talks about bringing pr- like proposals into the presentation and then telling them they're not allowed to look at them because it yeah. sort of does it does those two things it asserts their power frame like I'm withholding something from you which you know you kind of need to do with executives so that you seem kind of like the alpha in that in that room. But also, you don't have them flipping through, you know, Gantt charts and numbers while you're trying to engage their emotions. Exactly. And it's also what Oral Klopp said, is that when you walk in a room, you want to, others to know it's like you have other opportunities as well. And that's the thing that goes with negotiations. If people know that you desperately need the other person, they already have the leverage. However, if you let them know it's like, hey, I, don't, I only have a finite amount of time to be here. But while I'm here, all my focus is directly on you. While time is a finite resource, my appreciation for this moment is infinite. So I'm here for that within this amount of time. And that's always been a way for people to respect my time and their time as well. By establishing, I know Oren speaks a lot about that. It's like, well, I don't consider like a particularly alpha move, but it does set the standard that, you know, while people might think of any agency as like, oh, they're just trying to sell me ideas, they make they realize that the agency is busy too. And they're choosing them as this time. Instead of finding another client, they're focusing on making us their client. And that sense of appreciation is developed on both ends. And along those lines, too, uh, when it comes to them making a decision, I know agencies struggle with this all the time, is that you send the proposal, you maybe you do a pitch, the, they, the client says, okay, we're going to make a decision soon. They don't give you a time. And then you're just waiting on it and you're finding, you know, six, six months later, you're looking at your pipeline and going, you know, what's happened with this proposal? Is it cold? Is it dead? Um, so that's the other thing, too, is like, what do you think about how uh, at the end of a pitch, an agency can position it so that the client has to make a decision by a certain time? Man, you're asking this for the perfect time. We changed our sales strategy uh, actually in July and we doubled our uh, monthly revenue in new business by doing this urgency call where, man, this is actually really cool because we didn't think it would work. Well, actually, after every pitch, we actually tell someone, hey, this is a start date that we can have immediately, and this is when you can get it. However, though, if you can't give us a decision, buy it. and we always give about a week or two, we'll have to delay your project in another month, and these are the projects we possibly have on docket coming in. And because of doing that, man, I kid you not, guys, like all the clients we were trying to close for the last two or three months closed all in July because we realized – oh my God, there's a sense of urgency here. I better book these guys now because they're really busy. And that's really important to remember is that we are busy. And if we're not transparent with our clients like that and let them know like this is the real way of the land, like we're growing, we're taking in new clients. You honestly aren't the only one, but we really want to work with you guys and we'll care for you like you expect and beat those expectations. But please meet us in the middle here and make a decision because we did this proposal for you now. It's to help you make a decision now. Not for later, but for now, because there's a difference between prospects and leads. You're a prospect if you have a need, but you are a lead if you have a, a, you have a budget, you have a deadline that's validated, and you have a deadline to a decision. And I always tell my sales team, I always tell them, focus on the leads, not the prospects, because the leads are the ones that will close a lot faster. Mm. Yeah. And it's almost easier, I think, with uh, an agency because they do, their service is, or their product is their time. And so they yeah. do have a finite resource. It's not like selling widgets or like even with us selling subscription SaaS. It's like, what's the reason to close now? I mean, it's not like you're going to be out of product if they wait three months. But with an agency, it kind of is, or it can yeah. be. 
Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing is like with the agency, we have to constantly remind people it's like we're not churning out pro or at least like not our agency, we're not churning out products every day. Like our product is comes directly from our people. And our people, just like I, have only I mean, as far as I check, I only have twenty four hours, they have twenty four hours. I mean the client is twenty five, but you know, we have to keep on a deadline here and a strict deadline. And by enforcing that, hey, we're busy, but we want to take care of you guys, it creates that common sense of respect. So maybe Oren's book really did reflect on me more than I thought it did, even though it's a really great book. It's just one of those things where it definitely helped us out. And like, you know, we doubled like our, what we had to make in July. And just because of the urgency factor from that. Mm. I think that uh, probably a lot of pe- uh, people are afraid of doing it because A, they really need the projects. They, you know, they can say, oh, we have a finite amount of time, and if you don't decide by this date, we're just going to be too busy. But they know deep down that may not be true, and they want to get as much as they can. So I think some of it's just fear of going, what if I say you need to make a decision by this date? They don't. What do I do then? Because then I, I still want the deal. How, do, how, do you, yeah. how would you recommend people get over that fear? You know, it's really like asking questions to the client. So when you ask, you ever heard of spin? like the sales system spin by Neil Rackman. No, no. And so like spins are really cool to make. Let me think it's uh situational questions, problem questions, uh, implement like impl- implication questions and then need questions. So it's like this, like when you start a pitch, you never really just go in and just pitch all the things that you have. You want to ask questions. And with that, let's see how, what kind of questions you ask. And so you asked me earlier, What's the best way to get over this fear? It's really getting the client over their fear, over our fear. And I'll explain in a second. So basically the first question that we always ask is, what's the situation going on here? Very, very open question. You never know what's going to lead, but within that answer, you hear a lot of problems. And they'll follow up with the next part of spin from situational problem by asking, so what's the problem with that? And they'll start talking a little bit more. Then you hear the amplification questions where person might be like, you know, well, honestly, my problem here is that I can't get X amount of revenue from my digital marketing right now. And you hear that and you're like, okay, so what's the implementation of that? Like what, what happens if you can't let that succeed? And they'll talk and they'll talk and they'll talk. And as you hear them talking, you'll hear them saying all these things that will happen to their business if they don't do that. And that's the pain points right there that you want to focus on. And when it comes to the final part of spend, the need, let the customers like tell them everything that they need and sell themselves on you. And right there is where if you have that fear, think about all the fears that your customer has that you're pitching right now and you're helping them. They're telling you literally what they want and what they need and what can happen if they don't have what they need. And so go in there, be the hero. Like You can do it. And that's the way I've always seen sales is that whenever I go in a room, is that I'm not pitching anything that no one no one needs. Like these people come to me because I know they need stuff, come to our team because I know they need stuff. And we know what's on the line if something doesn't happen. And by doing that, I feel like that's a, a genuine sale. It's a trade of goods and services that's truly meaningful to each other's party. And that's why I would tell anyone that's like scared to put on the urgency factor. It's like if you're scared to put on the urgency factor, sometimes you're thinking, maybe I just really need this for myself. But think about from the client's perspective, Maybe they really need this more than we need it. And by having that kind of mindset, I feel you have a much more genuine approach where it doesn't feel uncomfortable. Does that make sense? <laughs> that makes perfect sense. That's yeah. awesome. Where where can people go if they want to find out more um, from from you and from your company? So I actually, uh, me and three other co-authors, all of, well, some of the two, well, one of them left actually, uh, we wrote a book called The Big Fish Experience, which is our truly our formula for creating great presentations. You can find it on Amazon or go to www.thebigfishexperience.co, and you can order a copy and get some free chapters actually on there. And within that, you'll find out our formula of content design delivery equals a presentation experience. And we break down pretty much like a textbook all the factors of what makes great content, what makes great design, what makes great delivery, and finally what makes a perfect experience. We use a lot of case study examples in there, but also we have, uh, my, this is my personal, I'm a lazy reader. Like Sometimes I'll read bullet points. And so at the end of the book, I told myself, you know, honestly, 
I want to create the book that I would read myself. And I know I would read this whole entire book. And I ended up reading it multiple times when we were like, we were writing on this book for three years. I, we created a bullet point section on the back of the book. So if you are a really busy presenter and you just want to go through some bullet points and reminders of what you should do, the back of the book is straight for you. But we really built a book that's for anybody that needs a presentation from a Fortune executive to even a college person or even a high school student. Like that's where you can find the most about our passions is through our book, The Big Fish Experience, or through our website, bigfishpresentations.com. That's awesome. We are definitely going to link to that in the show notes. I think I might pick up a copy, too. Yeah, me, too. And I like the I'm a lazy I'll send you a copy. Too. No, no, I'll send you all a copy. <laughs> really? We get free free swag? Free copies? <laughs> of course. I'll send you all even more than uh, the book. We'll send you a bunch of swag. <laughs> That's awesome. I appreciate well, we, we have a couple of new salespeople starting, so that'll be great. That's right. We're yeah, hiring we'll rec- our first we'll, sales. We'll require them to read it. That's required reading from this point <laughs> forward for salespeople here. If, Pitch perfect. If that's the case, I'll send you the chapters that they should definitely read then. That's awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks for being on the show, Kenny. Um, pleasure to have you, and I appreciate you taking time away from uh, birthday celebrations to share all this awesome info with us. Well, first off, guys, this is part of the birthday celebration, so thank you so much <laughs> for having me. Our pleasure. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your right. time, Kenny. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Agencies Drinking Beer. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you rate and or review us on the iTunes store. If you have a story or lesson to share with other agency owners and managers from around the world, hit us up. Just email Kyle or Kevin at proposify.biz. And also, if you write business proposals and you want to make that process a whole lot easier and more streamlined, Check out proposify.biz and sign up for a free 30-day trial. Cheers. Cheers.